everyone. My name is Rebecca Tabor. I am the coordinator for Connecticut History Day, and I'm really excited today to have the second of our historians chat chats going on. Um, as you are thinking about what topic that you can do for your 2023 History Day uh, project, these videos are meant to help you think about some potential topics you could explore. As we know, this year's theme is Frontiers in History, People, Places, Ideas. And I really recommend to all of our students that they look at the resources on the National History Day website. There are videos, the theme book is uh, located there, along with the um, theme sheet. A couple of things really strike me about um, the theme video. One is that people as pioneers, it can be borders, crossing borders, but pioneers also exist in terms of society, the arts, and technology. So look to what your interest is. If you love fashion, if you love um, motorcycles or technology, think about something that really interests you and explore that um, opportunity. And also think about your own personal history or your family's history as avenues to finding a great topic. In order to help you in your journey on in History Day, we uh, wanted to talk today focusing a little bit more about American history. And I'm super excited to welcome three friends um, to our historians chat today to brainstorm a little bit about some potential topics. Dr. Melanie Newport is an assistant professor at UConn, Hartford, and we're glad to have her with us today. Dr. Don Rogers is an adjunct lecturer at Central Connecticut State University Emeritus and is a longtime History Day friend, so especially glad to have you, Don, with us today. And then uh, last but not least is Dr. Fiona Vernal, who is an associate professor at UConn. So welcome to all three of you for joining us today and helping our young scholars as they start their uh, History Day uh, journey. You know, one thing that I don't know that all students know is that when you're a professional historian, when you are a professor, you actually have um, an area of focus, an area of specialty in your research. So would you like to talk a little bit about what your area areas of specialty are? Thank you very much. I'm uh, really pleased to be here and pleased to help uh, History A students. So my background is in American legal and constitutional history. So I study the, the work of the courts, uh, the creation of legislation, uh, constitutions, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I have taught that. I've published several books on this. And uh, from legal history, I've branched out into civil liberties, labor history, progressive era, and Connecticut history. So, so it sounds narrow, but in fact, my uh, teaching and writing has been pretty broad. And I should mention that the Connecticut State uh, Supreme Court Historical Society sponsors two special prizes at the state contest. So we'd really encourage students to consider a legal history topic because there are some really amazing ones. Melanie, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so I'm a specialist in uh, 20th century American history, uh, specifically political history and urban history. Um, so I'm very interested in the places uh, where people live and struggle for power. Um, so, you know, my specific research is on prisons and jails and policing. Um, yeah, that's all. Fiona? Uh, thanks for having us. And, and I'm excited to see what the History Day students uh, come up with. Um, I am a professor um, of history and Africana studies. I study primarily um, African history and my first uh, projects focused on Christian missions in South Africa. Um, I know that a, a lot of people might not know what Christian missions, um, Christian missions are, but there was a time in history um, when missionaries had to go around and preach about the church and preach about Christianity and try to convert people. And I was really interested in what that meant for people's um, lives and lifestyles. I am now venturing into urban history and I'm doing a lot of urban histories of Hartford 
uh, right now, those projects focus on how people made Hartford uh, home and what the city has meant for, gener for the generations of people who've done so. Great, thank you. Um, my first question to, to all of you is when you hear the word frontier, what does the word frontier conjure up in your minds? So I, I guess I'll go first again. So um, it conjures up in my mind two uh, different connotations. The first one is going to be sort of long. And so uh, having received my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, uh, the first uh, connotation is the idea of the uh, uh, frontier thesis or the sometimes called the Turner thesis uh, coming from a, a, a lecture given by uh, Wisconsin historian Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893. Uh, this is what we might call territorial or geographical uh, frontier. Um, uh, Turner's essay was enormously influential in the writing of American history until the 1960s, although it's been a battleground since then. Um, and uh, the History Day theme narrative just mentions this briefly, but students can get a closer look at by, by getting this book uh, published by um, uh, Bedford uh, St. Martin's, uh, The Frontier Thesis, uh, Does a Frontier Experience Make America Exceptional? This has uh, uh, Dr. Turner's original essay and the response by many modern critics uh, on that subject. And um, what this meant to Turner was that there was in American history a constant process from you know, the first uh, Europeans arriving on Eastern shores through the 19th century, a constant process of moving out onto, and he uses an unfortunate word, free land uh, in the West uh, to uh, uh, set up institutions there. And what was unique about this land is that it did not have established or I mean, he might call them civilized institutions of government, law, church, or, or the economy. And so there was this process in American history of, of, of uh, Euro-Americans mainly moving west into uncharted territory and creating institutions uh, anew. Um, and um, th this uh, got away from old theories, which argued that largely American history was kind of a, an extension of European values and European institutions. Now, nowadays, uh, this is uh, uh, a theory that's much under attack. Um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Western land was obviously not free, that was already inhabited by native people, uh, native societies. Uh, settlers, as uh, Turner saw, were not all white men, but women, African-Americans, Mexicans, a very multicultural caste. Eastern institutions like railroads, economic markets, and the government had a huge influence on the, on the, uh, the settlement of these frontiers. And settlement was, was not a peaceful process, but is rife with violence, uh, racial injustice, and environmental damage. So it's a very controversial theory now. But um, the reason why I bring this up and mention the book is there are three really important ideas that still stand, despite all the problems with the Turner thesis, that students might benefit from. And that one is the idea of the frontier as uncharted territory. That is territory where institutions are not stable, they're not settled, but there's a need to sort of recreate them and build them. So that, they're, they're that uncharted territory. The second thing is that the frontier experience is a constant experience in American history, perhaps even down to today. You know, Americans are, are constantly moving into new uncharted areas and creating new institutions. Um, and we might argue that, uh, you know, that even though the Western frontier closed in the 1890s that it may continue overseas and into space today. That's the way you might look at it. Um, and the last thing is that, uh, is that Turner regarded the frontier experience as, ex as unique to America, that this really made the United States what it is. And that's controversial because other countries, Canada, Russia, Australia had their own frontiers. So, but they, those are three ideas that, that, that he, he posited. So that's one conception. And quickly, a second conception um, is I, I, that I have is the legal frontier. And the legal frontier means to me 
there's areas where judges and lawmakers encounter brand new economic, social, technological situations for which the law does not have rules. And consequently, there's a, there's a need for judges and lawmakers and constitution makers to create new areas of law and new principles you know, um, and institutions to deal with those new situations. So, so those would be my two conceptions. Yeah, I think as a, as a historian <laughs> who trained at the University of Utah, uh, the interpretation of, of Turner that I found really useful came from a historian, Patricia Limerick, who wrote a book called Legacies of Conquest, right, that helps us to appreciate, I think, that, you know, a lot of American history is uh, defined or shaped by these moments of encounter and conflict and demonstration of power that happened uh, during these settlement moments. Um, you know, I think it's it's important to consider that there are all kinds of uh, moments of uh, violence and confrontation that are part of that history, you know, that I think can be really useful for us to think about uh, as topics. I think of, you know, Native people specifically asserting their vantage points on what um, frontier settlement meant for their lives. So there's a great book called Facing East from Indian Country, right, that really emphasizes their perspective. So I think that might be uh, compelling as a project. Um, and I think that interpretation also helps us to um, look for these moments of choice and creativity that are, are part of these moments of conflict and confrontation that happens in these specific spaces, because I do think of frontier as having, you know, a connotation of, of ideas specifically about space when we're talking about the settlement uh, of what is now the United States. Um, so, you know, taking it closer to the present, I think of, um, you know, these frontiers where, uh, Mexican and Mexican American farm workers are fighting for their rights as laborers, right? Fighting for safety at work. Um, I think of, uh, you know, these kind of frontiers of the imagination where people imagine new possibilities for their rights and for their place in American society. So how do, um, you know, through things like the Los, An you know, Los Angeles riots or rebellions, how do we have the streets becoming frontiers as people assert their own kind of political autonomy um, and challenge kind of modes of governance that they find unjust? So I think, um, you know, we don't have to necessarily think about it as a primarily Western story, but sometimes expanding our kind of sense of where to look uh, for these legacies of conquest can be useful as we think about the frontier. Well, for me, I'm right in the middle of thinking about um, the terms frontier and in my new in my projects on on Hartford and one of the um, main ways that I've been thinking about it is whatever the concept of frontier we're using, it's about movement and mobility, right? Whether it's the movement of objects or peoples or ideas or the, you know, sort of the transportation systems that, that encourage and facilitate the way that people, the way that people move. And so I think it would be really useful um, in this year's competition to think about what is it that set people, what is it that set people on the move? In my current research, for example, I've, I'm finding in the 19th century that African Americans were really mobile. Um, some of you may have, you know, heard about the Great Migration um, in the 20th century and heard about this, you know, mass movement of six million uh, people. Um, of African Americans from the South to the North and to um, the West and the, the Midwest. And in, in pushing the timeline back, if, you, if I'm thinking about the 1800s, I was wondering, what is it that made, that restricted people's movements in 1800, in the 1850s, um, 
in the 1860s and the kind of stories that we tell about the 20th century, are they relevant um, to the stories that we tell about the 19th century? And in some ways that answer, that answer is yes. Another thing that's very um, interesting for Connecticut's history is the movement of African-Americans within the state. So the movement from rural areas to urban areas as people are leaving the farm and looking for um, opportunities to work in an urban areas, opportunities to work in manufacturing, um, or just experimenting with, an op with um, opportunities um, after the end of after the end of slavery. I, I have found in my research that a lot of people were moving into, uh, moving into Hartford. It was the wealthiest city um, at the time in the, in the state and people were exploring new ways that they could take advantage of um, living, in, uh, living in Hartford and working um, in Hartford. And in terms of thinking more broadly about frontiers and movement, right? There are a lot of scholars who are working on connecting the stories that we tell about how people um, move to, a, to broader movements. I know that one of the, Mia Bay just, um, just won a major um, prize um, for her book about um, Black travel. But I would encourage, in the interest of fun, right? I would encourage, um, those of you who are going to be doing research to think about people traveling, you know, what does it mean to travel for work versus traveling for, for leisure, for family life, to think about migration, which is always a, a, constant, um, a constant theme, but think about the context of migration, right? For those people who uh, have legal mechanisms for applying for visas and moving to different countries versus those who are in exile from their countries or those who have to um, escape or seek um, seek asylum. Uh, to think about new stories we can tell surrounding the pan pandemic about the way we were all stranded at home and how that has shifted the way that we might even think about the relationship between work and commuting and travel um, for work and whether that gives us leverage now with our employers about working um, about working from home or thinking about um, sort of this global world right that we are part of and the kind of objects not just people that move around right but the kind of objects uh, that move that move around I know for a lot of Caribbean families for example you know, every six months, every eight months, folks are packing these massive barrels and sending sending items from the U.S. Um, to the Caribbean to sustain um, their families. But a lot of it is, um, you know, the sort of electronics that you would um, electronics that you would consume. So think about sort of frontiers of goods and how that might provoke particular um, particular ideas. And then finally, um, sort of frontiers, virtual frontiers, right? Social media has completely um, sort of flattened our world <laughs> even more. And the way that we are able to use um, digital, the way that we are able to use digital media um, now to both um, connect and consume and to virtually travel to other parts um, of the globe, uh, the, the travel industry, right, has been completely transformed again um, by the pandemic. And now they're offering, you know, five day immersive tours of Turkey, five days immersive tours of Egypt, right? You, what does it mean that there are travel companies that are actually doing very well right now who are encouraging you to sit in front of your TV and um, have your vacation and your travel from home? Right? Do you want to see Pompeii? I mean, I don't. I don't think I want to see Pompeii from my couch. <laughs> um, but there, you know, but there are new businesses that have that have come up, or new parts of businesses that are saying we understand that there's a pandemic, or even mobility, physical mobility, and access issues. Um, and maybe there are some people who are not going to be able to to travel and would still 
maybe like a virtual re like to be able to use virtual reality to really feel like they're in the pyramids or really feel like they're at um, Pompeii. So I'd like you to I'd like to encourage all of you to think about frontier, but also to th think about the word frontier specifically, but also to think about the word mobility specifically and to think in those ways in terms of legal mobility, that imaginative space that um, Melanie is talking about, you know, the movement of ideas, of images, of people, um, and, and, and come up with something fun to try to connect with these ideas. And, you know, Fiona, you said something that a few things that really struck me, one of which is as we're living in today's world, and I was just thinking to myself that um, 20 years from now, the pandemic is going to be like the ne the biggest topic ever in history day with all the changes that we've seen. Um, and I'll probably still be here, um, you know, a little grayer, perhaps, but um, but one of the things that really strikes me about it is that as you're thinking about for our students, as you're thinking about how life has changed and, and the virtual world has kind of taken over as part of the pandemic, all the different frontiers that we broke in terms of um, technology. I was thinking as you were speaking about, because um, most people who know me know I'm very into the British royal family and and the um, te the telegram that was sent by Queen Victoria to the then president of the United States, you know, that was a frontier of communication. And so there are so many ways that as we live in today's world, thinking back a little bit of like, well, where did that come from? And how did, um, you know, how did, how did we get to this point? I think is it allows for some really interesting topics. And I think the other thing you spoke to that I wanted to just mention to students as well is that, um, and, and, and Melanie, you also spoke about this as well, is sometimes changing your perspective, not just looking you know, westward, but then looking eastward and thinking and and thinking about how there was there were frontiers in Australia. You know, there are ways to look at other countries that had not exactly the same issues as our country because all places are unique. But you know, the whole that and Canada is another place that would be interesting to think a little bit about in terms of frontier frontiers and you know because you did have people pushing westward and there were native peoples already there so I think there are some ways to like be very creative about about topics Don you looked like you wanted to say something but it I'm not sort of the next uh, uh, yeah. subject which is what topics would we recommend yeah absolutely yes the, it kind of leads right into it I just wanted to I just wanted to to, to jump in um, quickly as well as well to to say one last thing about um, in, in terms of frontiers that that even as we're, we're thinking broadly, this is also an opportunity to think about your own families. Right. And to mm -hmm. to think about like the multiple generations of your family and you know, whether they're rooted, whether they've been rooted in one place, you know, for three or more generations, or whether they've come from other um, places to where they are now, to, to think about like the, what those frontiers have, um, what those frontiers have meant, you know, personally for your families, and, and that you might find out that, you know, your family members have participated in, in historic, <laughs> in historical um movements that can be an entry point um an initial entry point for a topic that you then you you build out a little bit um later on if you want to figure out like you know like what what brought your family to bridgeport or what brought your family to waterbury and how how many generations deep is your family in waterbury or darien um you know or derby that might that's that that can lead to exciting discoveries as well i think and also thinking about if for instance, um, did they participate in jobs that it was a frontier they were breaking because they were the first female or whatever? And I'm really glad you brought up the whole idea of family history, because I think some of the best projects I've ever seen have to do with people exploring their own family history. Um, one young lady, uh, her, she had a relative, and of course, the theme was different that year, but she had a relative who stood up to 
to Adolf Hitler and ended up being executed. And you know that there are some amazing topics within a person's own family or the place where you came from um, originally. You know, we've had students who uh, can look at a topic. So if you want to be a little bit creative, you know, think about how some of these topics we've talked about today, um, you know, my family's all British Isles, but we've had students, you know, so frontiers in history, you could study women's uh, movement to get the vote, not just in the United States, but also in, in the United Kingdom. So there are some great ways to do that. So this really is a great um, kind of transition into kind of our next big question, which what topics would you recommend to students that they might think about considering uh, to explore this year? So I think that um, this theme is, uh, I mean, it conjures up numerous topics. This is a very rich theme. And so I have a bunch of them and I'll just uh, throw them out for, you know, hope maybe students will find some of them interesting. So if you think of colonial Connecticut or colonial New England as a frontier, which it was for Euro-Americans, I mean, one of the, uh, the subjects I would suggest is how were the initial institutional law and government created? This is particularly notable for Connecticut and Rhode Island because neither were charter colonies. That is, there was not a, a royal charter that authorized settlements of these areas. And so Connecticut and Rhode Island basically had to start from scratch and create a government within. And that, that might be interesting uh, too, to explore how uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island, maybe even a comparative uh, stub study to, uh, to look at that. Um, um, Native Americans, I agree with uh, Melanie that I mean, Native Americans are hugely rich uh, topic uh, area for uh, this particular theme, because I mean, from you know, the first arrival of Europeans, I mean, into the 20th century, there have been constant clashes between Native people, you know, and uh, settlers over uh, control of the land, uh, the, the rights of Native people, uh, the sovereignty of Native people, and I think I, I, there are numerous papers and projects that students might, you know, develop uh, touching on ep episodes, you know, of, of that that ongoing constant struggle. I mean, starting right here in Connecticut, I think think of uh, Metacom's War, sometimes known as King Philip's War, is just an excellent example of sort of the, the clash between Puritan settlers uh, in Rhode Island um, and uh, and Native Americans over not only the land. But jurisdiction, I mean, they, they, they got sparked by a murder. And there was a, a dispute over which legal system was it Native American, Wampanoag legal system, or the, the Puritan legal system that, that would deal with this. So that would be a good case. Or, I mean, the Cherokee cases, so the Cherokee removal cases of the 1830s, um, other Supreme Court cases. You may know just a recent de case, decision from the recent term, the US Supreme Court, McGurk versus Oklahoma which is about the right of Native Americans uh, in Oklahoma. And the, interestingly, it's determined that much of Oklahoma still is now under Native American control by, by federal treaties. So, um, so numerous topics that, that you know, uh, episodes that, uh, that students might look at there. I think the California gold rush is, is, would be um, play on words, a gold mine for different <laughs> topics because because what the California gold rush represented, I mean, California had just been conquered by the United States in the Mexican-American War. So it's an area still, you know, largely people by Mexican peoples, Native Americans, uh, the, the gold rush starts, Chinese people come in from, from Asia. So there's a lot of different groups in operation there in a territory where there's no government, and where there's no government. And so, so um, um, I mean, women play an important role in the California gold rush. So I, I think that's, you know, really a good topic area for someone wanting to look at the West Coast frontier. Um, it may seem corny, but the homestead process, I mean, the process of, you know, establishing farms in the West after the Civil War, many good projects there, because you can look at from the angle, not only of the, the white farmers, but European immigrants from women. Many women were, were you know, homestead farmers, African-Americans. Uh, were homestead farmers. So that would be an area. Big area that, uh, that uh, Melanie mentioned is borderland studies. 
this is a hot new area of research, looking at areas that sort of our borderlands are not quite under control of native people, not under control of the Spanish or the Mexicans, not under quite under control of the United States, but it's a contested area. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the University of North Carolina Press has just started a new series of the borderland studies, you know, on basically on what's going on in those borderlands. And um, two titles stand out, just this recent books, Gina Marine Martino, Gina Martino, Women at War in the Borderlands of Early American Northeast. Okay, so with raw women in that struggle in the Northeast, or um, uh, or Andrew Roger and Gerardo Gruza Laveza, uh, These Ragged Edges, History of Violence Along the U.S.-Mexican Border. So the Mexican border is a, is a subject, a lot of studies, you know, uh, as, as a frontier. So, and one last suggestion on, on the, the territorial um, uh, frontier is uh, think about overseas expansion. And right after the, uh, the so-called Spanish-American War, uh, there was a debate over how U.S. law should apply to new parts of the American empire. And Supreme Court issued a, so, a series of what so-called insular cases, U-I-N-S-U-L-A-R, the Supreme Court cases to determine, do the Bill of Rights apply to Puerto Rico? I think that was one of the issues. So that, that would be another possible topic. So one quickly again on the legal frontier, I mean, even Connecticut, so again, it's been a pioneer here on you know, creating new law and legal frontier, uh, new areas of law. Uh, two cases I'll mention, Kent Law versus Connecticut, 1940. How does the Bill of Rights apply on the state level? So this is a freedom of speech case in, in uh, uh, New Haven, or famous case Griswold. I mean, applying the, you know, the creating a new, uh, you know, enunciating a new right of privacy on the, uh, the uh, national stage. And one, one final case, um, I think that this is a mention by Fiona. I mean, this is the age of the internet and there are all kinds of questions. Well, how do you apply, you know, First Amendment free speech rights to the internet? And particularly when, you know, we have, you know, um, bad actors in political speech, you know, uh, misinformation. So, I mean, uh, the look at some cases like ACLU versus Reno, R-E-N-O, 1995, the first case to dis determine, you know, whether uh, uh, the federal government could regulate speech on the internet. So those are a lot of ideas there. Just, I think it's a very rich topic area. Thank you. Some really great ideas there. Um, Melanie? Um, I mean, I, I was thinking of a couple of things that we haven't, really talked about, which is like the history of business and capitalism uh, so often requires, um, you know, not just creativity and innovation of new inventions, but actually going to different places to get materials. So I was thinking of examples like the Ford Motor Company going to Brazil uh, so they could get, you know, rubber for tires um, and creating whole colonies there. Um, I was also thinking of, uh, you know, frontiers of kind of health and safety. So how the creation of agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, they end up going across America through the DocuMerica project, which you can find online. It's a series of photographs. And they take pictures of the environmental impact of pollution and urban development uh, that were, you know, making people sick uh, during this period. So how do we understand kind of spaces that we think of as stable, you know, a highway like the Silestine Highway um, as actually a frontier of social and environmental change at different points? Um, you know, I was also thinking of uh, places both of arrival, right, where people are kind of finding a new frontier of possibility for themselves, places like um, Ellis Island or Angel Island, or even the, the places that people kind of lived when they immigrated to the United States, but also places of removal, right? So. Uh, what kind of frontiers do people encounter when they're removed to uh, an Indian reservation or uh, as Japanese American incarcerees during World War II um, in prisons, you know, across the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries? 
Um, so I think there are lots of ways that we can think really broadly, but I would encourage people to think you know, specifically about place. And if there's a place that you've ever been to or want to visit that you'd like to learn more about, um, sometimes just looking into the history of that place can be a really good starting point for thinking about a topic. All right, I think I'm, I think I'm up next. I, not only because I'm working on it, but because of what's going on demographically um, with the, with the movement um, of, of different groups of people into Connecticut. You know, one of the, one of the things that um, there's usually some alarm about how many young people are leaving the um, leaving the state of uh, Connecticut, but at the same time, there are huge swaths of different kinds of people who are moving into into the state, right? And so, one of my areas of interest that I think is is still ripe for these kinds of projects is to think about the newest, you know, sort of the newest Americans and then the newest generations of folks who've chosen to make um, Connecticut home whether that's West Indians, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans, but also um, people relocating from various African countries um, to Connecticut, um, South Asians um, relocating. So folks coming from like Bangladesh and Pakistan um, and India. So my, again, migration always is a really great lens for, for thinking about these topics and to provide some fresh fresh perspectives to say, well, who are the newest groups of people who are moving um, into our, you know, into particular um, cities and what's prompting, what's prompting that um, migration. I'd also like to recommend some um, the hyper local, local histories. Um, you know, if you're ever walking down a street and you wonder you should wonder, you should start wondering, you know, like if there's a church or if there's a, a synagogue, you know, how long has it, um, how long has it been around and who's using the building now, right? Is the, is in, in Hartford, for example, some, you know, a synagogue has um, become a more general, general purpose um, building or it's become another church, it's become an Adventist Adventist church. So to think about the history of a particular building and what that tells us about the different groups of people who may have lived in the lived in that area and used that building in a particular way as a way of talking about as a way of talking about frontier. Um, I'm also thinking that food um, as a topic um, would be um, would be really um, great as, a, as an entry point for thinking about um, you know the the blossoming of like food truck culture right um for example and what that what that tells us about uh maybe the restaurant industry but what that also tells us about you know the kinds of food trucks that we have i would love for somebody to do a census of food trucks <laughs> um in you know in their city um for example and then sort of use that census of food trucks to see what it tells us about how a particular, um, a particular place um, is changing. The, um, <clears throat> I was just pouring through about 500 in, images from um, the Army Corps of Engineer that's on the Connecticut Digital Archive. And I'd like to encourage all of you who are doing your topics, right? That's a really great place to start is the Connecticut Digital Archive, the CTDA. Um, and it made me, I was pouring over images of natural, natural disasters and flooding in the city of Hartford between 1936 and again in 1938. But I think disaster response, the way that we think about natural disasters, um, since they seem to be happening more often, um, the way that fires in California is helping us think through some of those issues as, and then um, hurricanes. Um, to look at the way that we've thought about um, natural natural disasters and our responses and how that might connect to the way that we're dealing with the um, sort of pandemic as a as a natural um, as a natural disaster as well. 
I'd also like you to maybe um, be a little creative in how you think through your think through your topic. Sometimes when I'm at a restaurant and I'm looking at who's busing the table, who's serving, who's who's busing the table, who's serving the um, food. When I used to um, visit nursing homes, right? Struck by I was struck by how many West Indians are working um, in, as nurses aid, for example. And so ask really interesting questions about who's doing what kind of labor um, and what that history is and, and why. I think that's an interesting um, frontier to, to, to talk about. Who's working at hotels, who's working in retail stores, who's working in various service um, in service industries and whether and and how those jobs may have um may have served a particular demographic for a particular reason whether you know there's a preponderance of women in retail for example or a significant significantly larger number of women in teaching uh for for example uh, to ask those kinds of questions about who does a particular kind of job and what is the history? Um, what is the history of that? And what does that tell us about frontiers in um, frontiers in labor? Um, finally, I guess I would say um, again in terms of situating your own self <laughs> in um, in a history. Um, you know, maybe think about your the house or the building. Um, that you live in, if you live in an apartment complex, for example, you know, is it um, sort of a new sparkling um, building that's part of a new high rise? Is it an old historic? Um, is it an old historic building? I used to live in a old, um, an old mansion in my my town that was related to the the very wealthy um, um, silk manufacturers that 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 their mansion then became a boarding house for women um, when women were moving into the area to work. And then that was in the 1930s. And then it became a general purpose um, apartment um, complex in the 1960s and 1970s. And it's currently under construction, um, again, as luxury, as, as new luxury apartments. Um, they were affordable housing, and now they're going to be luxury apartments. So, you know, being being really centered and situating yourself in your own neighborhood, your own history, and thinking about how history is imp is impacting, you know, where your families chose to buy a house or where your families um, families live, as a, again as an entry point that might get you to another part, um, another part of the another part of the topic. And I just wanted to say one thing about the insular cases that um, were mentioned. So though all of those cases are now a um, full text archive um, on Yukon's website, but you know, so in terms of, in terms of exploring, right? <laughs> in terms of exploring, it's very easy to um, explore from, from, from your desk, from home. Um, in terms of checking out the Connecticut Digital um, Archive um, and different sources that are there, again, you can explore um, explore from home. And just to remind um, students who want to work more on the genealogical side, right, that you can access ancestry.com um, from your um, public library if you want to dig into if you want to dig into your family history. And you can access, you know, the Hartford Current, and depending on what town you're in, maybe your other local newspapers um, through your through your public library. So if you're interested in that kind of that kind of work, right, that you don't have to go and get your own ancestry um, subscription, which is kind of expensive, you can definitely use the public library, which all have subscriptions to Ancestry.com. And Fiona, that was the most perfect segue into our next uh, topic of uh, discussion, which is about 
as professional historians, what advice um, do you have for someone conducting research for a project? Are there, play you've already given us some great recommendations for uh, sites to visit or places to go to. And as the daughter of a public uh, librarian, I was really glad to hear you give a shout out um, to libraries because oftentimes libraries will have access to um, databases or subscriptions that you might, your school library mo might not have, and you can um, make use of that. I would also give a shout out to the fact that we have so many wonderful colleges and universities in, in the state, and I don't know all of the policies. Even if you can't take out a book, you can go to the library. And, you know, I know, like I did my undergraduate research on a 13th century uh, Barons War in, in England, which I'm always happy in another conversation to tell you about, but you know, you could find if you're doing a, a project, you can f sometimes find those resources at a college or university library um, because they're going to have things that are their libraries are designed for people to do to do research. So I was really glad to hear you um, mention some great places um, uh, to start with, and. Um, do our other panelists have ideas for or recommendations for uh, great resources, great um, places to visit? So I, I can. Say, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Don. So, so I would echo. I mean, the uh, the advice to go to the library. You can find a lot of sources digitally online, uh, but in fact, I mean, the the digital sources are selective, and uh, and. Um, in particular, if uh, in-depth secondary reading is uh, likely to be found in books in the library. Um, and one of the values, when one of my recommendations is go to the library, don't just rely on digital sources, although they're obviously very rich and important. Um, check out scholarly books and check the footnotes. I mean, often you can find uh, uh, research topics are often, the sources are very specific to that topic. So it's very hard to, to recommend a, a repository that's going to have something on every topic that, 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 that such a repository doesn't exist. <laughs> but you can find you can find you know, the sources by looking, you know, at, at books on your topic. Look at the footnotes. Look at the bibliography and find out where that author went to look for sources. That 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 could be a, a good guide. Um, one recommendation I would I would make for sort of teasing out, you know, topics is to look at the, uh, it's, these are classroom books, but they're very useful. It's the Bedford St. Martin series on history and culture. And these are used for the classroom, here's one of them um, on Native Americans. And what these consist of is an introduction by, you know, a scholar, this is by Colin Colloway, uh, and then a series of primary documents on that topic. And uh, these are extremely useful. And I think it's worth looking up Bedford St. Martin's and looking through that series and seeing if there's, you know, a book that, that you know, touches on your topic. And then you can go in and you can get sort of an up-to-date overview from the introduction and look at some of the primary topics. So there's this one, which uh, echoes a point that Melanie made, uh, our hearts fell to the ground, Plains Indians views of how the West was lost. So the Native American view of, of you know, Western uh, the conquest and settlement. Uh, there's one on the gold rush. This is very, uh, it's very rich. I mean, it's about Mexicans, about Chinese. It's about the law. Um, violence in the West uh, is another one that you, that you can find in this series. So, so these are, you know, you, if you can't get them, you know, uh, buy them, you can probably get an interlibrary loan uh, to, to, to look at these. Um, for primary sources on legal documents, I would highly recommend the a Avalon Project at Yale University. You can get this online, and these are digitalized documents on not only American history, but world history as well. That's Avalon, A-V-A-L-O-N Project, Documents in Law, History, and Diplomacy. There's thousands of digitalized treaties, laws, court cases, you know, everything wow. you want. If you want, to, if you want, to, you want to take a legal, pers legal perspective. And finally, we shouldn't forget about the State Library. A state Library has some excellent sources. Uh, some of the digitalized, some of them you have to go there. But for Connecticut topics in particular, I mean, there, there are some uh, some real uh, treasure troves that you can you can turn to. 
I can just uh, jump in and say, um, so in addition to the state library and your public libraries, um, the various historical, the various historical societies, right? Um, especially if you're doing, um, especially if you're doing something that's local, like um, I'm going to be do doing an exhibition on shade tobacco, for example, and so the Windsor Historical Society has a really rich trove of materials on shade tobacco. It doesn't mean that there are no other materials on shade tobacco in, you know, there's lots of materials elsewhere at the State Library, but the Windsor Historical Society has a particular, as a particular co connection, collection on shade tobacco because of the importance um, of that industry to the town. And I think the historical societies are sort of a gem, a really important gem that, that, that people don't, um, you might not realize. Um, and also, you know, depending on the kind of topic that you're doing, you know, a, the church, churches might have their own archive, right? May not have handed over their archives. Um, and so local churches, depending on the topic that you're working on, um, might have their own might have their own archives and of course I would encourage um, I would encourage um, anyone who wants to conduct oral histories um, to, to contact me we are running um, um, you know a la carte trainings um, at the University of Connecticut um, is offering a la carte trainings so if you want to conduct oral histories or incorporate oral histories um, into your project, right? You can sign up um, um, at your convenience for a an oral history um, oral history how to nuts and bolts uh, workshop to make sure um, that you're employing the best methodology um, best methodology as as possible. Fiona, I was really uh, glad you mentioned churches as potential sources because um, one of our students last year did her project on um, the Amer uh, the Armenian genocide, and she actually gave a presentation to a local church here in Hartford, and she asked, and, and the priest asked, who here has been impacted by the Armenian genocide? It was a Armenian church. Everybody raised their hand, and so there could be topics that you're exploring that could relate to Hartford, but perhaps also to other, you know, to Armenia or to, to other parts of the world. And you have resources here in churches because they ha they're they're primarily made up of um, folks from that background. And so that's also, so I was thinking to myself, you know, she hadn't known about uh, these folks and they would have been a great uh oral history project to go out and and talk to um so i was i'm really glad to hear you mention churches because i think those are those are a great opportunity as well yeah i just want to draw attention to some of our um kind of national resources that, that i use on a regular basis uh the websites for the smithsonian museums you know especially relevant to our conversation today i think the museum uh, the National Museum of African American History and the Museum of the American Indian. Um, they have great objects, artifacts, documents, um, interpretive essays that can help you understand a topic. Um, I also really like uh, the Library of Congress for things like this. For video resources, um, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting and the website for C-SPAN, which we think of C-SPAN, like that's boring, but you can often find really interesting, well-done lectures that will help you understand a topic better uh, from experts. Um, and then finally, one of my favorite websites is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has a, a timeline of art history. And so this includes not just art like paintings from different time periods across all of world history, but it includes things like household objects, um, decorative objects, things like chairs that have a history uh, that mm -hmm. can help us understand what it was like to live and create on these kind of frontiers. So I think as much as we can, you know, think broadly about how we can use things like uh, objects, movies, books, photographs, 
uh, to think about the stories that we're trying to tell that can make it more interesting to the audiences that we're trying to connect with at History Day. I thank you for all of these recommendations. And I would just kind of add one more, which is the Chronicling American History Project, which is uh, encouraging uh, newspapers throughout the United States to be digitized. Connecticut's received grants numerous years, so they, we have a pretty rich uh, collection online, but other states. So if you're looking at a topic from another state, that's a great way of looking at different viewpoints about the topic you're studying. And then the last thing, I think, Don, you might have said this uh, several years ago, but it's something that's always stuck with me, that students, um, one of the first things you should do when you're doing a History Day project for your secondary research, read a book. You don't have to necessarily read the whole thing, but um, it provides great contextual uh, information. As as Don said, it helps you get to those. I can remember, you know, at midnight in college, looking at my secondary source, looking at who did what research, what research did they use? You know, where's their primary sources? That it's a great place to start with. Um, and for those of you who have judged in, in of our panelists, what you know, maybe a few, a few sentences worth. Um, what what advice would you give to History Day students um, who are approaching their topics this year? And I can start off with my, because I judge at the national level. Um, I would say this is kind of a, a, a continuation of what I just said, which is um, looking at some good secondary sources to give you context. Um, just going online, finding some that Joe Smith wrote a website on something is not good secondary research. Um, I'm not anti uh, online research because wow, one thing we've learned in the pandemic, there's a lot of great stuff because it's not just a matter of like things being closed down. It's a matter of can you can you make that trip or you're doing a topic on uh, California, you're not going to jump in the car and drive 3000 miles. But um, so there are a lot of great um, resources uh, that you can find online, a lot of archives, but please do some good secondary research and look at some books or articles to give you good context and not don't just rely on someone's random website. So. Yeah. The, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so one of, this might not sound fun, but shelf reading is a lot of fun and, and can lead to some important um, finds. So if, you know, if you found one book um, go to the section of the library in the public library where that book is and you'll you'll find a lot of other um, books that's related you know to that what this maybe the specific one um, that you 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 went to get and and you know sometimes I go I, I go to go get one book and then I, I come back with three um, or four because I hadn't yet pulled up the other the others that were on the shelf in my in my um, search. And I would say, like, have fun, right? Think about how can the, how can you tell the story in a really fun and exciting way? Like, you should have fun with this project. And if you're if you're not looking forward to it, if you're not having fun, if you're not excited, try to investigate why it you know why it doesn't doesn't feel fun, and ask yourself if you've picked the right if you've picked the, the right um, topic, because this is an amazing opportunity for you to sink your teeth into, sink your teeth into something, whether you're doing your own family history or whether um, you're doing something that's more, con you know, that's more conventional, that's been done all the time, but you wanna do it in a more, in a, um, in a new way or in a more exciting way. Um, it really, it really should be fun. I, I think, I, I, I find, um, a lot of joy in my own work and I wouldn't I wouldn't do it if I didn't and sometimes it's very easy to forget when you're you know you're you're cranking the cranking out the work and putting in the um putting in the hours but I I love the sense of adventure and um discovery and sort of finding out just how connected we are to people in the past and sometimes how completely different we are from people, um, from people in the past. So it, it really should be fun and provoke a sense of adventure and curiosity. 
Yeah, I, I love that thinking about kind of what makes it fun, especially when we get to go down the research rabbit hole, you know, during those kind of <laughs> moments of discovery for us. Um, I, you know, thinking about kind of the next step, when we think about translating this research to other people, the question that I always kind of ask myself is like, this is interesting to me. How do I make this interesting to other people? Right. So how do I connect to their humanity, their emotions, their experiences. Um, so for me, that can mean, you know, trying to find really interesting representative stories from individuals, um, trying to find things that make me feel something about the topic, right? And conveying that through, through a project, I think, can, can help to add to that sense of, of fun and excitement. And you know, using your family or your siblings or your friends as a kind of test audience, what works to, to translate your topic to them? Um, because sometimes I'll think something is really interesting <laughs> and my students don't care. <laughs> so you, know, you have to kind of experiment with, I think different kind of ways of delivering your topics, um, but finding those things that really stick and that people can remember those special details that show that you've done really thorough research can be part, I think, part of the really fun part of doing research. So I, I would echo um, uh, several things that Fiona and Melanie have said. Um, I, I totally agree with the idea of shelf reading. This is one reason to go to the library. You go to the library and look at the book and you also look at the books on either side of the one <laughs> that you went to get. To see what they have to say and what they have to offer, and I uh, I, I totally agree that often you find insights and angles uh, by doing that you know than more than you would have you just been looking at the catalog online, and absolutely have fun, you know and uh, you know uh, you know enjoy the discoveries and convey that uh, the 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 joy of the discoveries to uh, to other people in your your project. Um, the one suggestion I would make, and I, this may only pertain to student papers, but one criteria for student papers is multiple perspectives. And I think this is one thing that I think, think that I, the student papers I've seen an area that can be strengthened. And what that means is that within the story that your paper or your project is telling, what are alternative views that come up, you know, and then acknowledge them and, and grapple with them. And also externally, have different people looked at your topic in different ways that you know uh, that you know than than the mainline story that you're telling. So I think a really superior project is one that acknowledges and engages the different points of view. And then you, of course, your your project can conclude what you think is necessary to conclude. But it's always good to sort of show that there's this perspective and there are these other uh, points of view. That's really true. And I think especially with the topic of front or the theme, I should say, of frontiers, where you, uh, as we kind of circling back to what we started with the whole idea of Western expansion, that there were very different viewpoints about that. And I think, um, you know, projects don't have to 50-50 say different viewpoints, but they do need to acknowledge that there are different viewpoints about their topic. And, um, you know, one thing that... Um, uh, I think strikes me about a really good project is those projects that bring up different viewpoints and acknowledge them. And, um, you know, I think those, those are, are really strengthened. And now um, the kind of the final question, which is kind of a fun question, I hope for our historians, which is um, because sometimes a um, amongst my, uh, amongst friends will say, well, if you could do a history day project, because we joke that we need an adult, um, an adult uh, category, because we find things like, ah, oh, that'd make a great history day topic. Um, but we're not allowed to compete because we are over uh, 18, sadly. But um, if you could do a history day project, what would you choose to do your project on for frontiers in history? Well, I, I, I'm not in the competition, but I feel like I'm doing a history day project already. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm working on, um, yeah, I feel like that all the time. I'm, I'm working on a really exciting project right now that would be, that, that would be perfect for history day. And um, it's something I'm calling the straw buyer. I don't know 
yeah, yeah. You guys have not, you know, you don't buy property. Your parents buy property, so you don't know anything about that. But it's when you set, when you get somebody to buy something, um, buy something for you. So I'm, I'm calling it, it's the straw buyer, and I have discovered a number of um, African Americans who have uh, given their funds to a straw white buyer to mm -hmm. purchase property um, on their, um, on their behalf. And I, I have, um, the perfect person and, and this could be somebody's history day topic. I, I welcome, I welcome the, you know, the, the, uh, the other perspective, um, this might generate. Um, I found, a uh, someone who was, um, who lost his property when Bushnell park in Hartford was being built. And he was a waiter in Hartford and he gave $2,500 um, to a straw buyer to conduct real estate transactions um, for him and um, ended up with what is like the equivalent in today's money of almost quarter million dollars worth of um, property by the time he died. And so I started looking for other people who were doing that. And so that, that, that would be my history day. Um, topic is the way that race influence um, people's ability to access the housing market and the solutions that people try to come up with in having um, straw buyers conduct the transaction for them so that they could get to so that they could actually um, get to purchase the property in, in, in peace without being discriminated um, without being discriminated against. So that would be my that would be my topic. Excellent. Melanie, how about you? What would you uh, do as your History Day project? I think I would do Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, which was, you know, considered one of the first penitentiaries, a site of innovation for the idea of imprisonment. It's a place where prisoners for, you know, the history of the institution from the 1830s to the 1970s are always struggling to kind of impose their own ideas um, and visions for the institution. Uh, but they have such cool primary source resources available. You can analyze the space itself, the neighborhood that the prison is in. It starts out being on the edge of town and becomes part of the inner city. Um, so you can think about how frontiers vanish um, with processes like urbanization um, so I just I think there are so many ways that that particular space and especially now that it's used as a place to understand mass incarceration, uh, both through kind of public history interpretation and art installations, I think shows kind of new frontiers for understanding the past so. And I like a place-based project. I, I studied historic preservation in, in college, so I love place-based. And I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, all the reasons why some place starts off at the edge of town and becomes, you know, in terms of uh, transportation and so many other kind of impacts. Um, I think that's there are so many ways to look at it, but so I'm, I'm a big fan of place-based museums um, as a great topic. <laughs> so um, I would, I would do something on borderland history, uh, probably uh, the Mexican American Southwest border, partly because I know nothing about it. And I always like to do topics where I will learn something, but I think that's really a very creative area, you know, where there's this, you know, this gray area you know, where you have different cultures competing. In the Southwest is Native people, Spanish people, Mexicans, uh, Euro-Americans, uh, African-Americans. Uh, it's sort of an up, you know, it's up for grabs. And uh, that would be a very interesting, uh, you know, study of, you know, how that area developed. I think they sound like all very good topics. Um, I look forward to seeing your projects in a few months. <laughs> I, I would go, I would circle back to uh, Fiona's suggestion about thinking about food. I lived in South Carolina for a very brief time, but I would be really interested in, in um, it kind of going to what Don was saying, learning about things I don't know much about and how, how there was this convergence of what enslaved Africans brought in terms of food 
food culture and how that really uh, amalgamated into native cultures and um, the the European settlers and and kind of how that became this whole culinary um, history. And so I think I would want to explore something like that and learn learn more about it. But I want to thank uh, our three panelists for joining us today. I think you brought up some great ideas and suggestions and ways of thinking about frontiers in history. And um, I know I'll see some of you back again as judges. And I uh, just want to thank you all for taking the time to encourage our young scholars. So thanks. Thanks so much and happy researching to our students. <laughs>